behind us. Well, maybe I'll give us a couple more weeks, but I know we had some good comments yesterday. You guys, all, everybody posted some, well, not everybody, a few people posted some great stuff. And uh, so we're going through the, the New Testament in a year. It's one chapter, not even one chapter. Some of it's uh, half a chapter. If it's a real long chapter. So, I mean, it doesn't take long. I, If you want to do it, um, and uh, if you look on the far left uh, screen, you'll see an invitation that looks like that. Join as we read through the scripture. If you click on that, it'll bring up the middle um, part of the screen there. That's the app. Uh, it's the Bible. So you download that if you don't have it. And then the final screen to the right or the shot to the far right there is what it looks like. And if you go down to the bottom, you'll see my plans. If you click on that and open it, you'll get that screen on the left. And then the days will go by and then you just push the button. And it, some of them have a video, although it's usually uh, the beginning of a chapter. Once in a while, they have a short video and then uh, the verse and then talk it over. And again, if you want to allow the notifications, um, I at least think it's a good idea to do the one that reminds you to read the Bible every day um, and you could put a time so it'll remind you at that time every day and then if you want more notifications when somebody posts something if you want to stay up on what people are posting you can get notifications or emails or however you want to do it um, you can create an account if you'd like um, and then change all the settings in there but again um, uh, interesting stuff, and you guys have been posting, talk it over, and it's good to um, to uh, to do all that. And I think it's great because I, I like reading all the posts and seeing what the Lord spoke to you or questions. And I, I know you posted a question or something, and I answered it was late. I think it was the Annabelle surgery, but I ended up going back because I missed one day. And the great thing is if you miss a day, I, I missed a day with Annabelle surgery. I just kind of lost track of everything. And uh, um so, uh, you know, we go back and it's just really easy to catch up. So anyway, I encourage you guys to, to do that and just follow along with us. And, you know, if, you know, even if you don't want to join in with all the chat or discussion, that's fine. Just read along yourself and then uh, it's really good. I'm enjoying it and I enjoyed the comments that everybody puts in there. Except for Patrick, there was one I didn't quite understand the other day and I was like, okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, anyway. Um, we, I was like, what did that mean? But, you know, hey, it spoke to him. You know, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, the, but it's okay. I, okay, well, Lord, you spoke to him, and I'm just going to give it an amen because um, I understand. Okay, um, well, if you would open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, um, Lord willing, we'll finish up next week in Luke, and uh, we'll start in 1 Corinthians. So if you want to start reading ahead a little bit, we'll be in 1 Corinthians in a couple weeks, so... Um, 70 messages in Luke. That's just, I, we've never ever taught that long through one particular book. I'm more of a like, let's get through it and let's get it done kind of a guy. But we took uh, in small chunks and subjects. And so it's been a long road through Luke, but um, we're going to be starting in Corinthians in a couple weeks, Lord willing. And thank you for your prayers for Annabelle. She is doing better after her second surgery. It was kind of on emergency. And so, um, you know, she went to the doctor. The infection was really bad and went in there. And uh, he had scheduled her for three and a half hours in Dominican. This, the, she had the original surgery done in the hospital. I mean, in the surgery center. And then he wanted her in Dominican. And they did ultrasound and CAT scans and all that stuff. But I appreciate your prayer. She's doing a lot better. So thank you so much for, for that and um, uh, praying for her. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, Luke 24, and uh, let's go before the Lord, and we'll pick it up there in verse 1. Father, we do thank you for, um, Lord, answering our prayers, first of all, with Annabelle, Lord, and we ask that you continue to heal her, Lord. And, and also, I, you know, I know uh, Deb's not doing well, and we just pray for her as well, that you would just continue to heal her and, and just help her along with you know, broken bones. And Lord, um, you know, those medical issues, Father, just we pray for her as well, Lord, as we do. And um, Father, again, we do pray for, for Kenny, uh, Thomas' son, Lord, that you would just heal him as he's pretty rough with COVID as well, Lord. And um, 
Lord, I just know COVID is pretty much everywhere. And, you know, I think the federal government's pretty much said we're all going to at some point get that newest version of it. And But Lord, we're, you know, there's fear and panic out there. But uh, we were talking about, Lord, before church, uh, you know, we put our trust in you. And we trust that you're going to see us through. And when our time is up on this planet, Father, as your children, it's up. And uh, we don't want to stay a second longer than <laughs> than you want us to be here, Lord, because uh, what you have for us is so much greater than we could ever, ever experience here, Father. And so we, we don't want to say a second past uh, when our time is done according to your plan and will, Lord. So um, we take that great comfort, Father. And as we will talk this morning, Lord, uh, about resurrection and our hope in that, Father. So we have great hope, and you prove that. And we ask that you would bless this time as we look into your word, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are going to be looking at the resurrection. Uh, again, as I, and I just want to point this out, even though we do go over it pretty much, uh, you know, a number of times throughout the year, we certainly talk about it, and certainly we talk about it on Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, but resurrection is a key component of our faith, and Luke doesn't spend a whole lot of time specifically talking about the events after the tomb, but certainly, um, you know, we see, um, uh, uh, you know, some of the example or, or, or we get a, a, a view that we don't see from the road from Emmaus and a couple of guys and everything here. But I just wanted to uh, talk about resurrection. It's, it's, so, it's so important to our faith. And I'll put up a couple of verses just to remind us. And well, um, so where we left off, I guess I put my slides a little out of order here. So, you know, he's, he has been crucified. That's the, uh, the hill. Uh, sorry picture. Why is such a terrible picture? Well, it's because of the picture I took, and and you can see that there's some graves up on top, and you can see the face of the skull. You can still see it today, and kind of down below is a Arabs built a bus station. Literally, if you could follow that face of the cliff down, they built a bus station that goes right up against to the edge of that cliff. Uh, it's still there, and you can still see it, um, but anyway, that's, that's what it looks like. And then, of course, Joseph, Arimathea, and Nicodemus took him to the tomb, and then that's where we kind of left off. Um, and, and then about our resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 says, But it, if we preach that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And there were some questions in the Corinthian church, which we'll talk about when we get there. But this is what Paul continues to say. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. And I, I can't think of it as more clear and in your face and straight to the point uh, is that verse. I mean, it's hinged on the resurrection of Christ. If that's not true, then, then, then everything else is suspect, to say the least. It's such a key component of our faith. And, and again, I emphasize this is because there are, you know, church denominations and groups that are, you know, are, 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 are constantly pulling away from the Word of God. And resurrection, they don't like to talk about it very much, or they don't talk about it in very solid terms, because, you know, resurrection puts it in the realm of, you know, miraculous, and, you know, I don't understand. They don't want to defend it. They don't want to believe the power of God. They, they don't, you know, I, I don't know. I, I can't understand it all, but I just know that's just a continual trend, uh, uh, you know, uh, for church groups to move in that direction, moving away from it. That Jesus is basically another good teacher, and, uh, you know, he's not much, he's different than, than the other good teachers of other religions that have come. And again, people want to put Jesus in that kind of a box. And, and clearly, the scriptures say different, you know. Um, you know, if he hasn't been raised, then then there is no hope, and there is no hope for us to be resurrected, and that's what that whole verse talks about, and that's why it's so important and such a key component of our faith, and we could spend all morning talking about the verses of the resurrection in the Old and New Testament, but I'll just put a, a couple of them out here. You know, uh, Romans 1 talks about this, the good news about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
And again, it just cements, and that's written in the New Living Translation, so it's a little different maybe than you, you've memorized it or something. But, you know, he, this is the good news. This is the good news that, yes, he fulfilled in the earthly line the Messiah, promise of the Messiah through David's line, but you know what? He, he's not like everybody else because he was raised from the dead and he is Lord. That it, it, it cements, if you would, everything that he said that is true because he was raised back to life. It was you know, God's promise that hey, everything that was spoken by him is true because look, at, I proved it by the resurrection. And then I'll put one last one here in 1 Peter chapter 1 again. Praise be to God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So we have, because of the resurrection, this living hope, and we have an inheritance that can't that can't be be taken away, and uh, th that's the the great news, the good news for us, and the promises of our own resurrection. That again, death is not, uh, or, or the end of this life is not the end. It's not. It's not the end for anybody, but certainly it's the promise we have after this life of the internal life and the inheritance and the blessings that we have as being a part of the family of God through what Jesus Christ did. He was resurrected, so therefore we will be resurrected to life and in Him. And so death isn't the end. As we, again, we were talking about early before church here. <laughs> it's not the end. We don't worry about that because we trust in Him. And so, again, uh, that's why it's so important. And as we talk through it, I just want to remind us of the importance of the resurrection in our faith and, and how important it is. And there's many scriptures that talk about that. All right, back to where we are here. Uh, let's just actually start in verse 56. So if you want to look up one verse from chapter 24, then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant, fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So that was speaking about last week we left off, the women saw where Jesus was laid, and what they did was they prepared burial spices and oils and fragrances uh, out, of, out, of, out of love and respect. That was kind of like... Um, it, you know, like a proper burial, I guess, in, in our in our way of looking at it. You know, that's the way you properly bury somebody that you love and respect. Um, you know, you, you treat their their body uh, with with respect and, and because of the love. And so you you know the body would obviously decompose, and so you put the fragrances and the oil and the spices, and it was just all part. Uh, you know, of you know, of love and respect, and I want you to keep that in mind because it's just it's really important to uh, this whole first few verses here. So they these women saw where they're buried. They knew what the proper thing to do was for the burial and showing love and respect for the body. So they get that already, but they can't do it because. Uh, of, of the Sabbath. And so they're resting on the Sabbath. And actually, Friday was a Sabbath and Saturday was a Sabbath because of the Passover. And I won't go into all that, but they're resting on the Sabbath. Let's just leave it at that. How's that? And then, verse one, now on the first day of the week. Okay, first day of the week. And what's today? The first day of the week. And I just want to stop there really quick is, you know, why do we go to church on Sunday? Some people ask that question. And if you run into a pretty die-hard Seventh-day Adventist, not too many of them around anymore. Um, uh, when I was younger Christian, and maybe you remember, the Adventists were really pushing a lot of Ellen G. White's teachings. And this, um, she said that um, going to church on Sunday was a mark of taking the mark of the beast. <laughs> Most of yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty wild out there, and even even in. 30 years ago, a lot of Adventists kind of sort of didn't really buy into all that because it was so apart from other Christians. But anyway, 
I, I say all this just really quick, and I just, I'd make this brief ba- pause here, is, you know, why the church began meeting on Sunday was because of marking Jesus' resurrection. Now, when did that actually happen? We know uh, the Gentile churches met, uh, Paul, as we'll go through Corinthians uh, and other places, you know, when you guys gather together on the first day of the week, it's mentioned in a few places. Um, and probably, you know, of course, the, the very beginning church was almost all Jewish, if not close to, you know, 100% Jewish. And so they would probably keep the Sabbath. But at some point, you know, to differentiate between Jewish traditions and Jewish, you know, the Jews and, and the Christians, they would adopt it t- taking the first day of the week. Um, so that that's where it came from, and of course the book of Colossians and uh, what Philippians uh, tells us the day isn't really important. Uh, you know we worship every day, man. Right? You know <laughs> we worship every day, and uh, if we were all off on Tuesday or Thursday or whatever, we'd probably just meet that day, right? So you know we we don't hold that day. Uh, we understand and respect it uh, in, in, memor- in commemoration, but we do it meet every week, and it started out in, in, in memory of this first day of the week when Jesus was resurrected. So I'll just make that brief little uh, reminder there. So again, verse 1, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, uh, they and certain other women with them counted everything to be the best at his tomb. Um, if you've buried a loved one, um, you know, a, a lot of people do that. When Annabelle, um, when her brother died, I, I know her, her dad went through, you know, great expense to put a nice grave marker and even build a little place over so you could sit there because it's hot down there and you could, if you wanted to be by the memorial site, the grave, you know, it would be shaded there. And, and if you would, you know, showing and expressing that kind of love, they wanted the best to be there. And you got to give these women credit. They weren't afraid who was going to be there or who would say anything or who would do anything. They wanted to make sure this was done because love compelled them. And they set such a good example on this. The women did, no question. Far above the men who are kind of still in hiding at this point. Um, But this is what I want us to see and we can't really miss. Is they, and the disciples as well, completely... uh, miss all that Jesus had told them. You know, the reason they're making the spice, that spices and the fragrant oils and all this stuff for his body is because they, the fact that Jesus would resurrect wasn't even on the radar. <laughs> you have to see that, right? If you believe what Jesus had said, you know, uh, the third day I'll rise again. He told him I'm going to be put to death. And, and then the third day I'm going to rise. I mean, all the times that he said that and repeated that and they had heard that, it wasn't even on their radar nor the disciples' radar. I just want us to kind of picture that, right? I mean, they went to this tomb. And again, this is kind of a picture of Gordon's tomb today, another one that I, I took and. And uh, uh, again, um, you get a sense of the going down there and there's a, a big rock that usually is there. I don't know why it's not there now that I think about it, but they have a ro- one that rolls in there. And, and they go down there and, and, and they're just not expecting to see anything but the body of Jesus. I, I just think that's important for us to see. So they're down there with the spices and then... Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, and, and again, uh, and as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Ga- still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. I love verse 8, and if you're an underliner or a circler or one of those things, it's kind of like, wow, I could have had a V8, right? <laughs> you know, sorry, you know that commercial, right? The, the gals are, are there. They, they have, they just, there's not even the thought that there wouldn't be anything but Jesus' body that they would find, and they would properly give it the burial, because remember, the burial was rushed because of, uh, of the Passover. And they're met now as they go into the tomb, and there's no body there. And they all of a sudden they see these angels and they're they're afraid they're freaked out again it's the same old thing every time you see it in the Bible when people run into an angel 
it is a very um, scary experience. Let's put it this way. They're always afraid. And these women are no different than that. And they're met by that. And they just basically say, ladies, gals, why, why do you think he would be here? <laughs> I mean, he told you how many times? I mean, remember way up back in the Galilee, and that was the beginning part of his ministry, right? So way back when, we could say, maybe, um, uh, he told you this. And he told you that he, he would rise on the third day. And as they say those words, and they're like, oh yeah, right, he did say that. And I just think, you know, it's, it's just funny, they, you know, how quickly we can all forget. I mean, how many times did Jesus say that to them, you know, and more and more frequently to the point where, you know, as they were getting closer to Jerusalem, he repeated it more and more. Even, uh, even earlier on, Peter said, oh no, I, far be it from you, Lord, that can't, be God's will, the Father's will for you to go down there and be crucified and then resurrect. You know, they just didn't want to hear any of it. And they just didn't believe any of it. They really, the, the gals, as much as they love and as much as they heard, they were there and expected to see a body and to put these, these spices and oils down as a proper burial for him. And then they see these angels and then they remembered, oh yeah, I love that because how funny we can all forget and we're not any different than they are. So they see the angels, they remember the words of Jesus because they, you know, reminded them, the angels, and then verse 9 says, then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And we know there was about 120 in that upper room in the beginning of Acts that, that we'll find out about Luke uh, later on. So, and it was Mary Magdalene, uh, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and other women with them who told uh, thing, these things to the apostles. So these ladies, and a couple of their name, come back and say, hey, we, Jesus isn't there. A couple of angels met us, reminded us what Jesus' words were, and um, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, we just saw a bunch of angels, and they reminded us. And, and he told us that this was going to happen. And again, the prospect of Jesus being alive, you know, I imagine put a lot of spark in their step to head back there and discussion as they're, you know, heading back to where everybody's meeting and probably most likely in the upper room, they were still meeting there. You know, it wasn't that many days since they had all eaten up there. And, and you know, to remind them what Jesus had said. So here's the great apostles and these great disciples and the faithful of the faithful being there after Jesus' death and, and worrying that they might be next. Here are these great men of faith, verse 11, their response to that, and their words seemed like idle tales, and they did not believe them. <laughs> I mean, great people of faith there, right? <laughs> you know, uh, we saw angels. Remember what Jesus said? These guys hear all this stuff, and they're like, yeah, well, on, that's just crazy talk there. You know, this is crazy. There's just no way. I just want you to, you know, get this sense of how they were thinking, the women and the men, all of Jesus' disciples after his crucifixion, that this was the end, and their faith had just seemed to hit all bottom, to say the least. Uh, they just didn't believe it. But we have a button, verse 12, Peter rose and ran. And of course, we know that um, the Gospel of John tells us that John went with him, ran to the tomb and stooped down. And he saw the linen cloths laying by themselves. And he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now, again, the disciples all their reaction was, there's just no way that Jesus, you know, this is this could happen. This is true. Again, when people like to um, run down the resurrection of Jesus or when they don't believe the resurrection of Jesus, one of the things that they always, you know, come up with, well, it was made up by a bunch of guys, you know, his disciples, they loved him, you know, they, they wanted things to continue, um, and so what do, you, what do they do? They make up these you know, fanciful stories. And that just shows you how much 
or how little they know of the Bible. Because you read the Bible, and that wasn't their thoughts at all. As a matter of fact, their thoughts were actually the opposite. They didn't believe in the resurrection either. It's quite frankly, uh, Pilate, or, um, the Jewish leaders knew Jesus' words, and that's why some of the other Gospels talk about putting a Roman detachment there to guard the tomb so that you know nobody could steal the body or none of, none of that could happen. Uh, they knew and remembered more of Jesus' words than his own disciples at that point. And so to come up with some kind of conspiracy theory, it's quite the opposite. They didn't believe it would happen. And it's just amazing how much faith they lost. And with lost faith, faith always comes hopelessness. They were walking by sight and not by faith. And it will bum you out every time. You walk by sight and not by faith. And everything that comes up and every speed bump in the road of life will just get you down and, you know, will throw you off course and it'll just, you know, uh, it just weakens your faith every time. And with the loss of faith always increases hopelessness. And of course, we know that because the people you know that don't know the Lord just live in that hopelessness and every speed bump is that. And I don't know if you've been keeping track uh, track so much of the, uh, you know, some of you in the medical industry, you know, obviously, probably, you know, you, Carl, you see a lot of this, but, uh, you know, how mental health is, um, it, uh, depression is at all time high. I mean, it's just up there with COVID. And there's a number of factors behind that, um, certainly. Um, but, you know, I, I can't help but to think, you know, worries and fearfulness and hopelessness lie at the, at, at, the, at the root cause or at the top of that pile. It always comes up because, you know, the faith and, and uh, the unknown and, and everybody's affected and all these things. And without the Lord, again, this is kind of like mirroring our conversation we had before church started here. We were talking about this. You know, people just, there's no hope and they give up and they just lose, you know, they don't have any faith or what little faith maybe they have just turns into despair and hopelessness. And it'll, when you lose, when your faith just goes down, your hopelessness increases every time. But you have to give Peter and John some credit. They, they, they doubted, but they wanted to kind of check it out. So they ran there, and when they get to the tomb, you know, they see, all they see is the burial wrap, wrappings. And, you know, some of the, you know, I usually don't head off into this area too much because, well, that's a whole other story. But, you know, the, the, the original in, in, intent of the words uh, give the idea of a cocoon. So he looks at it and imagine, uh, you know, you, you've all probably seen butterfly cocoons or caterpillar cocoons. And then the butterfly comes off and then you've probably seen them hanging there. And there's just kind of an empty cocoon there. And I don't know. You've all seen those. I know I've seen them dozens of times and more than that. And, and think of it like that. that. That's kind of the meaning uh, uh, that a lot of the Greek, original Greek manuscript translators kind of give that when they expound on it. It's like a cocoon. So they see this, the wrappings and the linens all, are all there, but there's no body inside. Uh, it, that, that's the idea. You know, it's not like... Um, not like Lazarus, right? When he came forth from the grave, you know, he's kind of, mm, I don't know, I always picture him as a mummy, right? You know, you always see him, mm, you know, Boris Karloff kind of, Karloff kind of mummy kind of deal, right? And, you know, they had to, hey, you know, unloose him. The guy can barely, you know, move. He's all wrapped up. And then they had to take all the, you know, it wasn't like they were laying in piles all over the place. It's just the idea of it, that, you know, it was, the, the wrappings were there, but, it, it, and it still had its shape, if you would, but, there was no body inside and he comes away just kind of scratching his head, you know, like an empty shell. And, and again, um, he, he's not there. And it just shows you again, they're moving maybe a little baby step towards faith, but they're still in this great hopelessness at this point. But this is key to the Christian faith. Again, resurrection is the father's amen or proof that all that Jesus said is true and the idea is look and see i like this quote and i'll i'll, I'll read it to you it is maybe a little hard to track i like that 
And again, I think that's so important for us to see and to see how hopeless these guys were and these gals were. And these were the, the cream of the crop. You know, they expected just to see Jesus' body there. And when it wasn't, even still, they're going to have some serious doubt. And, uh, but it doesn't, the story doesn't end there. Thankfully, it doesn't end there in our lives either. Amen. And so uh, we're going to kind of pan the camera now away from Peter and John heading back from the tomb and the uh, disciples and then all of them meeting in the upper room to this little story here now in verse 13. And it says, Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. Now, for some reason, uh, again, and I, I think, you know, personally, Luke is here interviewing these two guys, uh, or at least interviewing one of them, because he's going to name one of them for sure. And he's talking, of, you know, as he's gathering all this, and, uh, you know, I... I, I believe that Luke interviewed, you know, uh, you know, Mary uh, and everybody else, uh, even back, uh, you know, uh, for John the Baptist's side of the family, Zacharias and all that, and, you know, put all these together and then interviewed and knew all the facts because he'll write the book of Acts um, and until the, until the point where he joins in on the travels of the book of Acts. But, you know, I, I imagine him picturing sitting down at least with one of these guys and maybe both of them. Um, and you know, what do two of them decide to do? Now it doesn't tell us why. So I, I'm making an assumption here, but again, you know, they just, um, they, they, they hear the women, they come back. And I don't know why they're going to Emmaus. I, I don't know. Just, I, I know personally when a lot's going on, I, you know, it, I like to take a walk personally. That's what I like to do. Sometimes I'll take a drive. Most of the time I like to take a walk and just, just walk and you know think and pray and just kind of get out of get get out of everything i don't know about you but i i felt find when i can be more in tune this is just me personally you know praying and when i'm really thinking over things if if i'm if my body is active my mind and my spirit seem to be free to to focus on that if i'm just at a at a static position, if I'm just sitting still, I, I find like that I, my mind wanders too easily. But if I'm walking, praying is very easy to me. Even if I'm driving, praying is very easy to me. Or doing something, you know, uh, a lot, it's just easy for me just to disconnect and be an autopilot on my body and then I'm not easily distracted. And anyway, and maybe that's what's happening with these guys or maybe they just, I just got to get out of here. You know, it's just too depressing and, and nothing's going right. Yeah, we heard these gals, but let's just, let's just, let's just get out of Jerusalem. It doesn't tell us, but they go. And, and again, here's a, a map and, you know, it's about seven miles. There's actually a number of villages with that name in it, uh, in and around Jerusalem. But it just gives you some sense they're heading towards the Mediterranean. That's not very far away, but that map may give you an idea. And they just, you know, they're just heading off and they're, just heading off in that direction, and uh, um, they do that. And then verse 15 says, So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. So these guys are walking, and all of a sudden, somebody comes up, up alongside them, which wouldn't be uncommon. There's a very busy road from uh, Jerusalem to the coast, right? So it would be a, a well-traveled route there. And so they're, you know, they're walking, and all of a sudden, Jesus comes up. Now, they can't see Jesus. They don't know it's Jesus, I shouldn't say. They know somebody's walking with him, but, you know, they can't see Jesus. And, you know... Was it because he didn't allow them to recognize him? Or was it because they were so hurt and disappointed that they could not see him right in front of their faces? It doesn't really tell us, but, you know, both uh, have a, a truth to it. Obviously, Jesus could just mask that for some reason, but I, I, I tend to think that these guys were so focus that Jesus was gone and they were so hurt and they were so disappointed 
that they, you know, in their own minds, it was so bad that, you know, they couldn't even see Jesus when he was right in front of them. And, um, you know, I, I think we can see some truth in that because when we're hurt as well, it's difficult to pick yourself up again and trust and to love. And these guys were definitely hurt by all of that. And, you know, again, that can be so overwhelming at times that you just kind of miss what's right in front of your face. And that very well could be. Um, and But he joins them. That's the great part. You know, that, that's what I see is that even if that's true, and again, it's just my supposition there, but, you know, you're so disappointed and hurt, Jesus doesn't leave them hanging there. And I, I tend to think that because they are leaving Jerusalem. They're not hanging out with anybody else. They're, they're heading off in a different direction. They're moving away. Jesus told them to tarry and wait in Jerusalem until they're, you know, given power. He's going to remind them of that. He has told them that, uh, you know, he's going to say it again to them as when they see him in the resurrect, uh, resurrected again. So, uh, you know, I just, he, he, these guys are kind of like the lost sheep and, the shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the other ones. And maybe these guys were just on a bad way, in a bad way, and so he shows up. Because he does that. Well, either way, verse 17, he comes up to them, verse 17, and he says to them, What kind of conversation is it that you, that you have with one another as you walk and are so sad? What are you talking about? And why are you so down? Then one of whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happen there in these days? And he said to them, what things? <laughs> now, I, I, I always get a chuckle out of this because, you know, I kind of think Jesus is being funny here. You know, what the, you know, like, what are you guys talking about? Why are you so down? What's, why are you so sad about this? Why are you walking away from Jerusalem? And and one of them, you know, again, Cleopas answered and said, you know, what, where have you been? You know, <laughs> uh, what, don't you know all that's going on here? And, you know, like what things? What's the big deal? Or maybe Jesus is saying to him in a sense of what do you have to be bummed out about? And again, he's, he's getting their attention, trying to get their thoughts and trying to get thinking of them. And what do you really have to be bummed out about? It's a good question to ask ourselves sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> when you think of all that we have and all that he's done, all that he's doing, all that he's going to do. Yes, there is always something to complain about. And, uh, you know, if you know me for very long, I can tend to find the negative pretty quickly in things. But the reality is when we look at the totality of everything, what do we really have to be bummed about? But he asked them, okay, what do you have to be about? What are you talking about? And so they said to them, things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. The pro he was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and to crucify him. And then verse 21 says, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to see the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Now, you can see how disappointment is really getting them off track. They were really missing out on the joy that could be theirs. Jesus is alive. He had conquered death, and there is great reason to celebrate that day. There was great reason to celebrate, but they can't see it. They just, just didn't believe that what Jesus had told them, what was in the, in the New Testament, that, you know, it was, it was such a faith killer. They are just focused on the negative and what went wrong and what they had hoped and their hopes were crushed seemingly and, and we just can't get off that, that cycle of hopelessness and despair 
and that disappointment that things didn't work out the way we had thought they would work out. And, you know, with disappointment, it can really knock you off track. And it, it definitely robs you of the joy that could be yours. Um, you know, disappointment usually comes when we expect something to happen just like them, right? It's a great illustration of that. And, and it doesn't work out in the time or the way that we want. And, and rather than us yielding to God's plan or will and timing, you know, we just get frustrated and mad at God or upset, or maybe we don't express it necessarily in those terms, but the reality is because you're not doing what I say when, or what I think should happen or how things should happen or when they should happen, you know, some reason you just get in off in this disappointment and then that turns to despair and that turns into the kind of hopelessness and you're on this t long tumble down. Well, rather they could be having a great day of joy and celebration, but they can't see it. And it's such a faith, faith killer. And they explain that perfectly to Jesus. And Jesus says to them in verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones, uh, slow of heart to believe in all the prophets had spoken. Ought not the Christ have suffered these things and enter into his glory so uh, again uh you know he kind of rebukes him there and says listen you know you're there's so much evidence for you to believe there's so much reason for you to have hope and so much reason for you to have joy on this day rather than being uh down and depressed and instead you know you're you're, you're moping around and heading off in the wrong direction and uh be, because you just you know, you're in this vicious cycle of hopelessness and disappointment, hopelessness, despair, and it's just killing your faith. And, and there's so much evidence and so many great things to the contrary that you could look at rather than this kind of vicious circle here. Kind of reminds me of this story I read um, it's a long time ago. This hurricane knocked off some bricks of this old brick building. And so this old bricklayer takes a barrel and hauls it up. Well, I'll read it to you because it's kind of fun. He says, you know, I, this is kind of his accent report. He got, I got to the building and I found the hurricane had knocked off some bricks around the top. So I rigged up a beam with a pulley at the top of the building and hoisted up a couple of barrels full of bricks. And when I had fixed the damaged area, there were a lot of bricks left over. Then I went to the bottom and began to release the line. Unfortunately, the barrel of bricks was much heavier than I was, and before I knew what was happening, the barrel started coming down, jerking me up. Well, I decided to hang on since I was too far off the ground by then to jump, and halfway up, I met the barrel of bricks coming down fast. <laughs> I received a hard blow on my shoulders and then continued to the top, banging my head against the beam and getting my fingers pinched and jammed in the pulley. When the barrel hit the ground hard, it burst bottom, allowing the bricks to spill out. And now I was heavier than the bricks. So I just start, started down again at high speed. Halfway down, I met the barrel coming up as fast and receiving several injuries to my shins. And when I hit the ground, I landed on the pile of spilled bricks, getting several painful cuts and deep bruises. At this point, I must have lost my presence of mind because I let go of my grip on the line and the barrel came down fast, giving me another blow on the head and putting me in the hospital. <laughs> I respectfully request sick leave. <laughs> That's one of my Cal OSHA reports there. <laughs> but don't you see the despair there like that? You know, it's like one bad thing after another, after another, after another, and you can see this whole hopelessness and despair and despondency and depression and it goes down this whole vicious cycle you know this is a problem they didn't want to believe um i think this is something for us to see because this is kind of key and it's not something comfortable to ever say but you know one of their problems was they just didn't want to believe that suffering was part of god's plan jesus told them that suffering was long planned by the father not, you know, just the wonders of wonders and all the great things and the miracles and all the wonderful, oh man, the blah, and the things that he did and the walking on the water and, you know, Moses and Elijah coming down and demons fleeing and 
Holy Spirit coming down at baptism and all the feeding thousands and tens of thousands of people and all that. We want to we want to see all the wonders, but we just can't really think that suffering is part of God's plan. It can't ever be part of God's plan, can it? And again, we can just think that way. Why is it so difficult for us to believe that the Father's will might be some suffering in our lives? I have a hard time with it, I'll be quite honest with you. And I believe that's where a lot of the rub is. We are going to have hard times. There is going to be suffering. There is going to be that persecution as a Christian. And we can see it forming in the world. And uh, I don't know if you've been in touch, and I'll just briefly mention this, but that, um, what is it, C4, C4, that Canada law now that, uh, you know, uh, conversion therapy for homosexuals in Canada now is a felony. In December, they passed that law. Uh, uh, Master's College, uh, what's his name? John MacArthur, you know, had this video and, you know, I, I've, I've seen it. And if you want to look at it, but he was supporting the pastor that's in Canada that he knows. But, you know, now, um, it really, if you speak evangel evangelistically and talk about homosexuality and talk about repentance and talk about, you know, a change of lifestyle uh, of any kind of those, you know, huge lists of gender labels and all that stuff, and there's a whole list of them they have listed there, it's actually a felony. And it, it's a direct attack on Christianity and evangelism. It really is. And, you know, um, because nobody else does that but Christians, right? Everybody else. <laughs> so it's a direct attack. And now it's a, it's a federal, what they would call a federal law in Canada. And, um, and you know, you know that some people, Ethan and I were talking about this yesterday, are going to go into a church and ask for counseling and, you know, make us a big trap, for, particularly for the bigger churches. And so uh, my point is, you know there's going to be suffering. And you know there's going to be persecution and you know it's coming and it's been coming and california has crazy laws that i think most of us don't understand because they typically aren't really enforced very well or they're not presented in the media but california already has those laws on the books you know we would be shocked by those i have to do training on them every year so i i i keep up on all those things as Anyway, but the po problem, the point I want to see is that, you know, we just can't seem to get it in our mind that the Lord might be in His will, that suffering could be part of His plan. And once we get over that hurdle is that this is part of your plan for whatever reason to mold and to shape me or, or to be used that my, my, my suffering and my difficulties as good and light for somebody else to come to know you or whatever it might be. Um, we just have to we just have to embrace the fact that that can be part of God's plan at times, and we have to be okay with it. And of course, He promises to never leave us or forsake us and be with us and give us peace through that that passes understanding. And we have all those promises, but we have to be willing to accept that suffering can be part of God's plan. And they were having a very difficult time with that. And so what Jesus does is, at that point, when they're having a hard time with that, this is what he does. I think it's a key solution. And at the beginning, verse 27 says, At Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, again, why didn't one of those guys write down what Jesus had said? <laughs> why didn't they record that? Don't you, wouldn't you love to have a copy of that Bible study and listen to that or watch that video or whatever? But I think the important during a tough time, how important it is for us to turn to the Word of God for strength and for encouragement. And that's what Jesus does. They can't understand why this is going on. They're really lacking faith. They're they're disappointed, uh, they're dis, you know, despondent, there's hopelessness, they can't understand the suffering part of God's, and so Jesus takes them to the Word of God to get encouraged and for strength. And we'll see the effect on it, and we'll finish up here, verse 28. Then they all drew near to the village where he was going, I'm sorry, where they were going, and he indicated that he would 
have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in and stayed with them. And now when it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they did, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn, our heart burn within us? while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? And so what did that cause? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. And well, I I think, you know, they, you know, seem to think that Jesus wanted to, you know, keep going, but they wanted to hear more. Why? Because they were being encouraged. They were being strengthened. And so they invited him to stay. No, we want to talk about more. We want to hear more of these scriptures. We want to hear more of what, what you have to say here. So they sit down to eat, and then they realize it's Jesus. And maybe they saw the nail prints in his, in his hands there. Maybe it was something that he said, and then he just disappears. But what's left behind is that their hearts were burning from the Word of God, or they had a renewed passion, or their joy had returned to them. And again, the Word will always do that for us. And I think they must have sprinted back to Jerusalem, right? I mean, they rose up that very hour. It was dark, and they were even telling Jesus, hey, don't go on. It's almost nighttime. You're not going to be able to see. I mean, there's no street lights. Come on. You know, and these guys did the very thing, and they just, as soon as Jesus left, they were excited. The Word of God renewed their passion, reminded them all that the promises and the hope and the plan of God is not fallen to pieces. It's just my thinking of it, my misunderstanding, or my own personal prejudices or way of thinking how God should be and not be and do and not do or whatever it is, you know, was causing them to do that renewed by the Word of God, encouraged by the Word of God, and took off a beeline to Jerusalem. What a change. From the beginning, as they were leaving Jerusalem, when Jesus shows up until this point. And I I think it's such a, a great witness to the encouragement of being in the Word of God, particularly when we don't understand things or things are disappointing or hopeless and and, and we allow God's word to work through us and realize and show us and reveal to us and return to us that spiritual, you know, renewal and encouragement that we need. And we'll see what they say next week and how they talk about what ex- they experience when we get to it next time. Well, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time that we get to look at these things and be reminded of these important, important lessons. And Lord, we ask that you administer them to our hearts, Lord, because we're not any different than these guys and gals. We're we're not. Um, You know, boy, it's amazing. Some things can just turn our moods on a dime or get us kind of off track in a a quick hot minute and our circumstances and situations. And sometimes we have these preconceived and set ideas of what you should and shouldn't do and how you should do things and the timing of things. And and, you know, um, Father, we, we, we lose track of that. And then we gets into disappointment. And why would you allow that to happen? Or why didn't you fix this? And why didn't you take care of this? And, and Lord, uh, we just need to hear from you and need to hear from your word and be encouraged um, in, your, in your word um, that we might remember the promises that you have given us and the things that you've planned and the reassurance that you won't leave us or forsake us and give us that peace and that love and and whatever else we might need at any particular junction of our lives, Lord. And we thank you that just like you didn't leave these two guys heading out of town and in despondency, Lord, you, you came alongside and restored and renewed their hope and their joy and revived their spirit and their passion for you, Lord. And I know you'll do the same for us. And so we thank you for that. But most importantly, Lord, for the resurrection and the great hope and faith and trust and importance that we put into it, Lord, because you, uh, it's your seal of approval on the payment that Jesus made and all that he said. And when he even said, words I don't speak aren't, aren't mine, but, but they're yours. Uh, we get to know who you are 
and what you're like through the words and actions and life of Jesus, Lord. And uh, so we thank you for that and those encouragements and the love that you show us, Lord, for it's in Jesus' name.